All right, well, here we are, the electro fishing boat. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do this, and there's a lot of different variations of electro fishing boats out there. For our business model, um, we basically build ours in house, and um, they're, they're modeled after what we do. So, uh, what we got here is we have a boon. Um, electricity, just to kind of simplify this, more or less travels uh, from the boom back to the boat, and it puts fish in a state of temporary paralysis in this area right here. Um, there's about 10,000 volts that travel through these cables, um, provided by generator here. Um, we're running usually between 10 and 50 amps of current, um, 10,000 volts, and it's a it's a uh, accepted method to get a small uh, data set, usually about three to five percent of the fish uh, in a lake. And, and we use it daily, um, both for exploring uh, new populations, seeing what's going on with the fish in a lake, and more importantly, we use it to manage existing populations. So every day, uh, team members go out into lakes that we manage on a regular basis, and we'll pull out the, the sizes or species we're not looking for and, and leave the ones that we are and tweak the population based on what our population goals are. Uh, this particular boat also um, has uh, equipment to apply herbicide. I don't think we'll be doing that today since there's not a, a lot of weeds, but um, um, and every lake has a, a lot of different facets that you're, you're going to touch a little bit if you're going to have a great lake. And so uh, understanding your population is one and treating your weeds is another and putting out lime or gypsum is another. Just a lot of things you might do a little bit here or there to make a, a great lake. So let's get the guys on here and go find out what's going on in the lake. Lee Sheck, one of the fisheries biologists with Lucko Lake Management. Uh, just did an electro fishing assessment. Have a few fish in the live well here. We're going to uh, take a look at them, uh, identify out a couple species, and do some length and weight measurements. Um, also going to take some genetic samples on the largemouth bass to um, establish a genetic profile and um, just generally a baseline for the fishery. We have a 16 and a half inch fish, weighs 2.3 pounds. We're going to take a genetic swab, going to rub this swab right here on the fish's tongue for about 15 seconds. Make sure we have plenty of material. We're doing this genetic sampling, we want to get a good distribution of fish in terms of their length. So we have a smaller fish here, be interested to see what, what their genetic profile is across all the different size classes that are 
in the lake that we've sampled? Nine inches. We want to know what the adult population is in terms of a genetic profile as well as these smaller guys, the ones the babies they're making, and getting the most robust data set that you can while being minimally invasive is, um, is key. If you're a scientist, you probably like to get you know, several hundred fish or as much data. Scientists love data, but in our, in our uh, model, we want to minimize stress on the fish, get a general idea without overdoing it. So we've got a 21 and a half inch, 5.5 pounder, pretty nice fish. Okay, we've worked up our um, largemouth bass data and now we're going to look at um, some other species that we collected here in the live well. Right here we have some threadfin shad, also have a gizzard shad there on top mixed in. One in my left hand is a threadfin shad. The easiest way to tell them apart without getting out a dichotomous key is to just look at the mouths. Here on the threadfin shad we have a terminal mouth that's right at the end of his body and on this gizzard shad here we have a subterminal mouth. It says a lot about their life history and real easy way to, to tell them apart. Got a crappie here. Also collected a couple species of gar. This is a long nose gar, aptly named. Also have a spotted gar here for comparison. They're not the easiest fish to hold. If you're, if you're a lake owner, you probably don't like having them in your lake. But as a fish guy, they're really interesting fish. Living fossils um, have a unique hard scale type called ganoid scales. Um, pretty interesting. They're great survivors, really hard to get out of a lake and um, interesting fish. We have another fish that you might not want to have if you had the choice. Pretty good sized common carp. These fish, you can kind of see his mouth is also subterminal and kind of sucker shaped. He's got these barbels here. They feed on the bottom and um, suspend sediments while they're foraging and they also can, he wants to go back in the lake. Disturb spawning uh, sites of beneficial species and generally in a managed lake we like to pull those out, keep their densities lower. The channel catfish right here, depending on your goals, not a bad fish to have. It's a common sport fish, good to eat. If trophy is your goal, maybe Maybe you skip them on the order list, but certainly not the, not the worst thing to have. Fish, fish in the kind of the same category in terms of life history. It's a freshwater drum. And what's interesting about finding this guy in our survey, and it says a lot about the level of influence that this lake receives in terms of um, the level of creek that it is. Uh, in a real ephemeral creek or a less flowing creek, you're not gonna see a fish like a freshwater drum that suggests that the creek is um, substantial, um, bordering riverine. Some more shad and bluegill. Looking for a red ear. We saw some. I don't know if we netted any. Here's what we're looking for. Got a red ear sunfish there. See a nice little red flap right there on his operculum. Here's our gizzard shad back. And unlike the threadfin shad, this gizzard shad is going to grow to this size and, and even larger. And um, because they grow quickly and do reach this large maximum size, along with some other life history uh, factors, is why they might not be uh, preferential compared to th threadfin shad. They're only gonna get about seven to nine inches on the high end, and certainly on the menu for most bass. Another crappie? I think that's pretty much it. All right, well, James, we've just got done with our electrofishing survey. I thought it was pretty productive. Nice spring day and saw a lot of species and uh, a lot of individual fish as well. Um, generally, I like to look over this, this data set before we get back to the office and really analyze it and see what you have. What do I notice? Really, this is a very average lake, uh, which is a great starting point. This, this is what people are, are dealing with all over America. Um, you're overpopulated with small stunted bass, not horrifically so, but certainly so. Um, you have all the right species in the lake. Uh, in addition, you have some species that 
we'll call them undesirable, stuff that's not really uh, adding to production, it's not something we're targeting with angling, not necessarily bad, but not something that, that we really want in the lake. Um, we've seen bluegill, red ear, um, which are both desirable sunfish species, uh, green sunfish and warmouth, which um, well, well aren't horrible fish, they do compete directly with bass. Um, we have both species of shad, which is great. Um, Threadfin shad, I like in every lake. Gizzard shad, um, there's pros and cons, but if you want big fish, it doesn't hurt to have gizzard shad in the lake. Um, we've got crappie, uh, looks like mainly white crappie so far. Um, channel cat, and uh, a lot of different drum and, and sucker type species, a lot of creek type species. I want to point out that this is a great survey. I felt like we got great data today, but this is just a snapshot. And so another season, uh, different water clarity, a different time, we might find some other species in here or different size classes. So on a big lake, you never take this as gospel. You take it as a snapshot and hopefully over time, you'll have a few snapshots and put together, they'll present you a great picture of what's in the lake. All right guys, we, uh, we just finished shocking and that was a lot of fun. That is so cool to see all those fish pop up and it was really, really enlightening. But before we get into the lake why and, and what we saw in this lake, it, I have to ask, what's what's some of the craziest, because you've done this forever, what's some of the craziest things that you've shocked up in your career? That's a long list. Yeah, I imagine. First off, I agree with you. I still, to this day, I don't do it every day, but I love electrofishing and I tell the guys I should not have to pay them to do it, but <laughs> they disagree, okay? Yeah. Things that I'm shocked. Well, uh, fish, the largest fish I personally shocked has been 19.1 pounds as far as a largemouth bass, um, which obviously would be our state record. Um, incredible fish. Um, I've shocked up a lot of fish in the in the 15 and 16 pound category, and you no, know, that never gets old. They're just oh. most of those are well managed fish. They're short. They're fat. They're toads. They're lunkers. They're just they're just unbelievable fish. Um, other species, um, I've shocked alligator gar that I believe were well over the state record. Um, some so big we couldn't even put the, the net over the nose. So Holy as far God. as size, alligator gar and the, the Trinity River Basin and some oxbow type lakes, um, that, those are the biggest fish. Um, blue and yellow cats up approaching triple digits. Um, those, are, those are interesting and, and I love getting those. And looking inside to see what they've been eating is always interesting. A big grass carp, 60, 70, 80 pounds. Um, goldfish, uh, got goldfish over 10 pounds before. Yeah, yeah, fact. Um, large tilapia, um, different types of aquarium fish. Those were really, uh, those were really surprise you. <laughs> I get something that looks like a piranha, and not expecting it. Um, probably some of the scarier things if if you're surveying and a bird comes out um, so a lot of times there's diving birds cormorants and coots and things oh. and and certain lakes have a lot of those and and a bird coming out at your feet on a quiet morning uh, literally inches from you and spraying you with water will, <laughs> will scare you a little bit uh, we've had some mammals in the boats and and alligators and, and that sort of thing um, you know what you really don't want to do is touch the water <laughs> so <laughs> don't touch um, the water don't touch the water. That can kill you. It has killed people. It will kill more people. Um, you have to be incredibly careful. Perfect conductivity, a lot of volts, and um, you can just never take it for granted. But uh, probably, you know, some of the bass I've looked at are my favorite, but um, I'll never forget having a 60 or 70 pound beaver in the boat with me once. <laughs> no way. Yep, they're not new. So you shocked it and you thought it'd be a good idea to put it in the boat? Well, it seemed like the thing to do. I didn't know it was in the water. and, and uh, I put it in there, we're going to take it to shore. It turns out that those little cuddly front teeth are actually weapons, okay? <laughs> and they're yellow, and they're nasty, and they're big, and they're oh, yeah. fast. So I'll never have another beaver in All right, good call. All right, well, right. <clears throat> now, back, now back, to, back to our focus. Lake Y, we, man, we shocked, a, we shocked a bunch of species. Oh, you know, yeah. We shocked some yep. bass, some, pr some decent bass. Mm -hmm. But uh, from a kind of a 100-foot level, now that we kind of know what's in this lake, mm -hmm. And we know what our what our ultimate goal is. Um, what is your gut feeling? I'm going to enjoy this project. I like the fact it's going to be around. Uh, one of the things when it comes to lake management is you have to stick with it. A lot of people get burned out after two or three years of doing what's kind of mundane, boring, you know, not a lot of glamorous type improvements. But the truth is, that's how you get there. You do the same repetitive things, tweak a little here, tweak a little there, and you get something great. So from 
you know, from up in the sky, say, good size, um, iffy water quality, um, average species composition, um, the, we want to stay away from growing too many weeds, uh, we want to increase production a lot, that's not very productive right now and it's going to the wrong species. Uh, work around the constant water flow here. Um, I believe this lake is going to take some just very traditional improvements. It's going to do a, a heavy feeding program, a, a quality stocking program. Uh, we're going to look at the genetics on the fish, and I think that long term, we're going to get some more of the genes in here for bigger fish. So I'm looking forward to improving that. And one thing that we did notice also is that there was not a, <clears throat> not a ton of cover in the lake. I mean, it's very, very sparse. Uh, so I think the next thing that we're probably going to do is take a look at uh, really, really cool ways to add cover and structure uh, to the lake. In your opinion, I think that will probably help. Absolutely. So uh, what a lot of times what we do with habitat improvement projects is put the fish where you can catch them. It doesn't do any good for you to grow fish if you can't go find them. Right. And um, so while improving, when you're designing a lake, having the proper habitat is going to incre increase production a lot. Uh, in an existing lake like this, a lot of what we're doing is not so much increasing production because we have other tools, but we're concentrating the fish to areas that we're going to go fish. Uh, this lake um, has a pretty uniform bottom profile with a, a few exceptions. I'd be excited to do a bathymetric survey on this and, and get you a tabletop model or something to look at. Uh, but there certainly is a little bit of deep water that we can add different types of structure and uh, bring the fish to where we want them to be. It'd be exciting to see how the different types of structure hold fish differently here because they certainly will. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, that's going to be it for this time. Next time, we're going to take a look at structure and cover, and we look forward to seeing you then.